Nothing makes people more unnerved than the idea of an invisible airborne virus. There's an environment that is changing and becoming way more uncertain. We know it politically, but we also know it geopolitically, which is that these events that are taking place in the United States and elsewhere are ricocheting one off the other. How worried are you about the world right now? Tonight, hundreds of Americans exposed to the coronavirus. There have been an increasing number of cyber attacks on election databases. As a key indicator in the bond market signaled a recession could be on its way. More importantly, how worried should you be? China is now faced with this very massive public health crisis. Growing concerns about potential cyber attacks coming from Iran. Historic victory for President Trump in the impeachment trial. A majority of Americans think a recession is likely in the next year. This is an important time in our country's history. We have entered World War III. Hello and welcome to the G-Zero World Podcast, where you'll normally find extended versions of interviews from Ian Bremmer's public television show. I'm Meredith Sumter, head of research and operations at Eurasia Group, and today I'll be asking the questions, including of Ian, as we look at some of the biggest stories rocking the world today and how they are impacting politics, the economy, and you. At the start of a new decade, we wanted to take a step back and look at all this anxiety about how the world is changing and parse out what really matters and what should you, our listeners, focus on. This special edition of the G-Zero World podcast was produced in partnership with City Private Bank. Without further ado, our guests today are Ian Bremmer. Good to be with you. As well as David Balin, Managing Director and Chief Investment Officer for City Private Bank. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for being with us. Ian, David, let's start by addressing head-on this fear everyone is talking about. Large numbers of Americans are concerned about rising inequality and their future livelihood. More and more experts are signaling their own fears that our long economic expansion is coming to an end. But at the same time, consumer confidence is high. So how should we make sense of this uncertainty and fear about the economy at a time of such strong consumer confidence? David, let's start with you. So when you look at what's going on in the economy, you have to look at the level of employment, which is very high not only here, but in Europe and in Asia. You have to look at the fact that consumerism is strong. People are buying things. You have to look at the fact that people are saving money right now. The U.S. savings rate, as an example, is at a 20-year high. At the same time, there's an environment that is changing and becoming way more uncertain. We know it politically, um, but we also know it geopolitically, which is that these events that are taking place in the United States and elsewhere are ricocheting one off the other. Uh, and, and and then lastly, to, to your other point, which is people realize that the world is unfair. And obviously that's coming through with the information that they're getting all the time about how are they getting their due, right? And they don't think that they are, which is what this polarization is about that Ian talks about a lot. And so I think all of these things are happening at the same time. Pocketbook is good. Other things don't feel as good. But that's interesting. People don't feel like they're getting their due, but unemployment is low, savings are going up. How do we make sense of that imbalance there? Different groups are getting different things. When we talk about unemployment in the United States being low, let's ask what jobs people just got. They're getting jobs at minimum wage. They're getting jobs at $15 an hour. They're getting unskilled jobs. The number of skilled jobs being created in the United States is very few. And let's take the housing recovery, which is taking place. It's having at a very slow pace relative to what it was prior to the last recession. So people's feeling that they're getting more is actually not so much. So when we have economists using the R word when they're projecting future economic growth and we have investors that are plowing money into bonds, how are you thinking about the economic fundamentals of the U.S. economy? So – They're using the R word because that's the fear word, right? Hmm. We've seen major shocks, right? Just the the, the trade war itself, the Fed making a huge potential mistake at the beginning of uh, 2019. Those big things could have derailed the economy. Then you have, you know, the end of the trade war and the Fed making the right choices. And then you have the coronavirus that is taking place. So even with growing levels of anxiety, the underlying consumer confidence and CEO confidence will continue to churn our economy forward. 
that has been what's happening, and that's what the people are missing, which is you can both have anxiety and anxiety on the rise at the same time you can have continuous purchasing and reasonable amount of confidence that tomorrow's paycheck is you know, ready to be banked. Mm, fascinating. Ian, you've written about the U.S. relinquishing its leadership of the global order to stake out a more independent America first path. Why is this happening? And what does it say about how American families are feeling about the world right now? Well, it's related to a lot of what David just said. I mean, you can have a global economy that's growing in a reasonably robust way. You can have an American economy that's growing in a reasonably robust way. But if the average American does not think that that is going to benefit themselves or their kids, if they don't believe in the American dream, if they think that the institutions, and when I say institutions, I don't just mean government, but I'm also talking about the corporations, the media, the banks, you name it, are not actually out there trying to protect them, then they're not interested in continuing to vote for the kinds of things that the Americans have been supporting in the post-war environment. What are those things? Well, it's global free trade, um, it's a bunch of architecture around America promoting democracy. Um, and of course, it's also about being the world's policeman. And so an independent America, a more unilateralist America, especially at a time when so many of the challenges geopolitically that we talk about around the world are actually much more proximate, much more dangerous for America's allies than they are the United States, whether we talk about terrorism and its export or refugees and forced migration or arms uh, races. I mean, these these things are largely not about America, at least directly and short term. And so a lot of Americans are saying they're not going to support a lot of the policies that went with it. Mm. So the focus really is you have baseline strong consumer confidence, but there's this anxiety about their onward mobility and the, the mobility of their children. And that anxiety, it means that they don't want to see a population that looks very different from them, so they oppose a lot of immigration. It means that they don't want to see other countries and other people doing better. Uh, and so why are we going to send our kids, their kids, mostly their kids, over to fight and get wounded and die in wars that are expensive? And also, let's keep in mind the way we consume information now is largely to have our biases, our preferences strengthened, mm. right? And, and, and as a consequence of that, you don't have the establishment and the middle class reading the same political prescriptives as they did even 10 years ago, never mind 30 or 40. And that certainly helps to drive both the polarization and the strong anti-establishment sentiment. That's true in across Europe, it's true in Canada, um, it's true in Australia. It's true in a lot of emerging market democracies, too. And how well is the United States equipped to take this more independent path? And what does independent America really mean for working families it, across it, the country? It's certainly more well equipped than a lot of other countries are. And I think that's what's important to recognize is that the United States, even as the U.S. is losing influence vis-a-vis -vis China in China's Belt and Road, and they're exporting a lot of infrastructure and investing in other countries. And just very recently, the Philippines said that they're going to shift their defense relationship away from the U.S. towards China. Why? Because China's dominant economically. So we see that happening. And, and if you were only watching that, you might say, oh, my God, it's all over for the United States. But actually, the power balance between the United States and everyone else in the world is actually increasing significantly in America's favor. And that's about American defense spend, which is greater than the next seven countries of the world combined. It's about America's energy production levels, by far the greatest in the world, and that's a recent development, food production. It's about how insulated the Americans are from all these other challenges. And so, and of course, the role of the dollar is the world's reserve currency, right. which is hardly a, a being diminished at this point. So you put all those things together, and you can see why a lot of Americans would say, not my problem, even though they understand that this may be bad for the world. They're like, yeah, but the rest of the world maybe needs to pay a little bit more attention to that. Like, it's not, it's not time for America to be the world policeman right now. Yeah. Yeah. That is the, is the prevalent view. But let me give you two counterpoints that I think are very important. And let's use climate change just as an example. 
America could be the source of a lot of the technological improvements and capabilities that would actually address climate change. It could be the leader. Uh, about 18 months ago, the cost of producing a unit of electricity through solar on an unsubsidized basis became uh, you know, less than oil, coal, natural gas forever. And just as whale oil, you know, sort of went away as it's uh, as a useful commodity. Which is deeply oil, sad for Nantucket. But <laughs> right, right. But very good for the whales but and person, many for personal whales. friends of mine that are whales um, are, you know, are now we're now seeing that. So, so the issue there is we could lead in that technology and do good for the world. But that's not the policy that's being laid out there. And, and in fact, by withdrawing from climate accords and by drawing away from that as a major issue, we're actually going to forego the possibility of the economic benefit of being that technological leader, as one example. A second has to do with market share. Well, in the short term, what Ian has said is absolutely what's happening, and it will feel good. The question now is, and let's just take China right now in their view of wanting to see Trump reelected, where everywhere I go, China wants to see Trump reelected. But in part, that's because that will allow them four more years to actually position their country and the resources that they can provide to the rest of the world in a favorable light versus the U.S. Had the U.S. administration decided to work cooperatively to attack the IP issue, to attack the market access issue in China, we might have ended up with a far better accord than the one that was just written that actually is only about the U.S. and really only benefits a very small fraction of the U.S., basically our farmers, and in, in ways that I actually would argue are quite diffuse. So what we've effectively done is as we've turned inside, we've also stopped thinking about the negotiations that we could have that would benefit the U.S. more than they had before and focused only on the immediate, what I would call um, superficial benefits that you get from going it alone. And this is what happens when politics becomes a key driver um, of economic outcomes globally. Um, you end up optimizing for domestic politics and you end up suboptimal when it comes to economic growth, both of the system, but also of yourself long term. And what we're seeing happening right now in the world, not just in the United States, but in so many democracies, is the inability to make long term strategic decision-making for economic growth. And the exception to that, of course, the big exception, is China. That's exactly right. And the key question is, when does that become obvious to the American people and to our political leadership? I would say not for a while, uh, because America is a very wealthy country. Um, because a lot of, I mean, right now we are seeing a, a level of short-term consumer confidence that they haven't had in a while for a lot of undereducated white men. And so if you ask me, this isn't like Tunisia where you have expressions of democracy because if you don't make it in the middle class, you're literally going to starve. You won't be able to provide for your kids. That's not what we're feeling in the U.S. We could easily have a contested and delegitimized election come November and the likelihood we see structural social instability in the U.S., even like we've seen in France, is actually quite low. Yeah, so let, let me just bring this full circle here because we started this conversation talking about strong economic fundamentals in the United States. And we have uh, in this country some of the world's most successful commercial companies, especially in technology. And the America First approach actually could weaken that leadership if we're not able to find a way to work constructively with other economies to ensure that the use of that technology and the way that our companies are expecting that trade and investment practices to work worldwide, if that's coming under threat by the America First path and by China's own onward path in the way that it wants to see the world economy to function. Right. That's, so let me give you an example. Uh, privacy, right? So if you think about the world that you're going to have, this bifurcated world, right, a, a Western and an Eastern world, in, in the Eastern world, privacy is not a big deal, right? They're willing to give it up, facial recognition, everything, all ready to go. In the U.S. or the Western world, not so willing to give up privacy. In fact, you think about the regulation that's taking place in Europe, uh, whether it's about u internet usage or in financial services, you're seeing privacy as being a major issue. So suppose you wanted to compete on that basis. Well, the U.S. would be very smart to aggregate all of those people who are interested in privacy as part of its coalition. But it doesn't do that because it's operating unilaterally and alone. Yeah. So there are certain Western values that could be part of a Western ecosystem. And by the U.S. withdrawing its leadership, that actually then will fade. And you'll see this giant gray area where 
well, that technology is cheaper. I'm willing to deal with the fact that the privacy issue is not so important. And bingo, that now goes into the Eastern economy or Chinese economy. And so then over the medium to longer term, that is a real concern and a fear that we should be paying close attention to. One that actually causes U.S. companies to become less competitive, if you think about it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's double down on China and shift the conversation to the coronavirus, which has been rattling markets and disrupting global supply chains. Ian, airborne illnesses like this one keep public health experts up at night. But does its place of origin, China, present any particular political issues? Um, Yes, and it also presents economic issues. We do need to understand that We're now living in a world where the soon-to-be largest economy is middle income. And it is state capitalist and it's authoritarian. That creates, by definition, lower quality economic growth. It means they have fewer resources to respond to crises when they occur. They're more likely to have crises because of the lack of resilience because of the poor quality of data, because of the reduced legitimacy of their own policy hierarchies and the unwillingness of those inside that hierarchy to give bad news to leadership because of the potential implications for themselves and their families. And we're seeing all that play out with coronavirus, but it's not just coronavirus. I mean, one of the reasons to be more concerned about climate is because China is... You know, they've got an awful lot of dirty coal infrastructure. And even if solar is cheaper, the Chinese are not going to be able to afford moving from one type of infrastructure to another without external subsidies, which the Americans, the Europeans are obviously not about to put forward. So this is wonderful to see billions of people joining the global middle class. But it's really problematic to see governance shift in that direction. And coronavirus, which is really the first significant global crisis that has come Mm. because of this growing importance of China, 17% of global GDP, nearly half of global growth, um, obviously is a lot bigger. It's a lot bigger in terms of anything that affects China. If they sneeze, the world gets a much bigger cold much more quickly now, but also because our companies their, their own um, supply chains are so much more reliant, whether it's Apple or whether it's Walmart. The future of the S&P in the United States is just much more dependent on can China get it done? And the answer for almost everything is not as well and not as clearly as the Americans or the Japanese or the EU. Yeah, well, this is well, China is the largest trading partner for the majority of countries worldwide. That's right. And so when that economy shuts down, it has ripple effects, not just economically, but also the way that people are moving across those borders. We're tracking cases in places like India, the Philippines, even Iran, and linking it back to direct contact with China. And China's response has been massive censorship, limiting and shutting down pieces of the Internet, state control of information, what people can and can't say, not full cooperation with the World Health Organization or with the CDC and the Americans trying to get in. I I have no doubt that Xi Jinping is doing everything possible to control the breakout in China, but the priority is political stability of Xi Jinping and the government. And that's a very different kind of response than what we would see in advanced industrial economy. Again, making the economic implications grow, but also making fear grow. And, mm-hmm. you know, David talked at the beginning, not, he said not just about the global economy, the American economy, but also how people feel about their futures and the way they're treated. And nothing makes people more unnerved than the idea of an invisible airborne virus that, you know, we don't know exactly how long it incubates and how many people it can infect and and through what mechanisms and how many people really are going to die from this thing. And we don't have a vaccine, right? And it's coming from China. I mean, you can't, it, it would be hard to create cinemagraphically Um, something that would scare the crap out of more global workers 
than that. And I think even as the Chinese get a grip on it and we start seeing the case numbers go down, it's gonna be a long time before the average American feels comfortable making a trip or returning to the workforce if they had been living there or they're, or they're you know, sending a student over for, a, for an exchange. This is gonna have big long-term implications for the Chinese economy, as well as for the labor footprints of American companies that have treated China as the factory of the world. Mm, David? So you'll see, uh, and this is already underway, but will accelerate now, a supply chain that evolves away from China. Both Chinese companies and uh, Western companies are already moving their factories all over Asia, whether it's Vietnam, Malaysia, Cambodia, to insulate themselves from the risk of being both too dependent on China economically and also too concentrated in a market economy that is, you know, that is not one that they're especially comfortable with. In, in doing a lot of work, you know, with, with Ian and in, in preparing for all of this, we actually looked at all of these global shocks. Very, very few have the long-term impact that you'd think that they would have. I love watching what and happens. World War Two does right. not happen very often. Correct, and that's exactly. the one. Right, well, and the Arab oil embargo and, yeah. the, and the ultimate yeah, the 70s, you know, enormous right. impact that it had on on the global economy at that time, which didn't have as many sources of oil. Right, yeah. it really but was. But nine eleven, no, n- not so much. Right. Exactly right. And we went through that, you know, that analysis. So when you see these things existing at the same time, the long term ramifications are those that I think Ian has touched upon, which is. What confidence are you going to have in your government, whether it's Chinese or the U.S. government, whatever, in, in a market when everyone is becoming more isolationist and yet when the, when the global supply chain cannot be broken? I always tell everyone, you're not going to be making car parts only in one country and bringing them all together. That is not possible. So global trade is going to continue in an environment that is politically and economically very different and evolving very quickly away from what its traditional norms have been. Excellent. Let's turn now to the U.S. election. We have primary voting. Do we that's... have to? <laughs> but it's the same subject we hear about every hour. Yeah, yeah yes. we're talking about anxiety, Ian. We got to go there. So we have primary voting that is underway in the United States and what is shaping up to be one of the most contentious presidential races ever seen. Ian, this was the first year that U.S. domestic politics made it to the top of your risk list for 2020. Why? Well, it wasn't on the basis of who was going to win. It was on the basis of uh, the likelihood uh, that the election's results would be contested, that the election process itself would be seen as delegitimized. And of course, since then, Iowa has been helping us out um, and the Russians. And we see that uh, President Trump has been briefed by the uh, the former head of uh, intelligence saying that the Russians actually are now interfering again in the U.S. elections and in Trump's favor. And he was sacked um, directly um, as, uh, as a consequence of that. Um, it's likely to be a close election. The country is incredibly polarized. The impeachment process played out exactly as you expected it would have, with the exception of Mitt Romney, one vote, a Republican vote against Trump on one of the two counts, but otherwise a complete party line. The average American that's watching all of this is saying, these guys are all full of it, and they're, they're just going to try to steal the outcome away from me. And I, I think whoever ends up losing the election is likely um, to do everything possible um, to uh, to contest that outcome. And I think the markets aren't really prepared for that. Mm. David, how the uncertainty around the U.S. election, how is that going to impact markets between now and November? So as the election gets closer uh, and the polling becomes clearer who uh, the candidates who the candidate will be on the, on the Democratic side, I think it'll have a pretty profound impact on, on expectations that will be disproportionate. So if it is, a, um, you know, Sanders, then the market's going to anticipate some radical change in Washington that, first of all, they may not get elected. And even if they were elected, it would require a pretty significant shift uh, in, in, you know, the, the House and Senate for anything to happen. Um, and, and so I think that the markets will react relatively negatively in the short term to the possibility that you're going to have a, a very progressive or left, uh, left-oriented um, candidate. The more interesting issue is really what happens after the election anyway, right? To me, if you look beyond the election, you got to ask yourself, what would Trump do in the next term in terms of trade? That to me is a far more interesting possibility given that, you know, the probability of the election of an incumbent is 75 or 80 percent, 
that's kind of frightening because then you can actually have real trade engagement or disengagement depending upon the strategy that could have profound impact as an example. Uh, you could actually have an international event. Some of the things that Ian's written about in his, his top 20 risks become more possible uh, in a world of that's destabilized. And so what you're saying is if you have a, a second term of President Trump, he is not going to be encumbered by re-election, right? So he can truly pursue a trade agenda or his international agenda, his America First agenda, without the constraints of an onward election. Correct. And you've seen that with, a, and again, I think that the trade accord with China took place predominantly because it was politically necessary to, to have a positive resolution, to have a, you know, I'm going to score that point now. But I don't think it represents necessarily the administration's view that this is where they want to be at all. And I think that they would aggressively engage with China. They would aggressively engage with Europe on a variety of things. We saw that in, in automobiles. Um, and I think you could imagine a, a world where trade becomes much more difficult and that would have negative implications for the market that are not being discounted today at all. So do you think the markets should be more concerned about a second term President Trump? Uh, well, I, markets get concerned within six months of whatever events are taking place. So, so do I think they should be now? It doesn't matter what I think. I think that that is a, a natural uh, and an appropriate risk that may be on Ian's 2021 list is actually what, what happens. Markets are, should be concerned about what the data is right now, right? And I think the data, as I mentioned, come from the outset is, is very positive. So it's very hard for you to come up with this R word, fear, recession thing that's going on. The reason why this election is so important in its own way is that if, if President Trump were to be reelected and we do see the full continuity of this, right, we will have had eight years of America first and eight years of what we've been discussing today. And that's going to put America's competitive position and the, and the competitive position of American companies in a very different place than they were when, when President Trump was initially there. The second side of this is in the event you were to have a left candidate elected, where would America go then? Right? Would it re-engage on climate? Would it re-engage on these treaties? And a lot of the candidates, to your point on what Sanders said, is they might not actually re-engage on some of those same topics. So this is an election of incredible importance, but the idea that it's you know positive for markets and negative for markets, depending upon whether the president wins, or, is not clear at all. It really depends upon where we go post-election. I mean, my issue with, with Brexit right, had less to do with the fact that the Brits were leaving and more to do with the fact that their entire political process was seized by this conflict over the result of the referendum for years. Um, and, and I do think that there's gonna be some of that in the US. It's the very divisiveness, the polarization, the gridlock, the inability of the Americans to get things done, the inability of the government to actually get to the business of governing. I mean, the UK finally, actually Boris Johnson won a strong majority and he can now go, he got Brexit finished and they, they still have to figure out the next deal that they will or won't have with the EU, but they can actually focus on governing a little bit. And the problem in the United States, of course, right now is that irrespective of who wins the next term, it's going to be very hard to do that. The market impact is ultimately less about Sanders or Warren or Bloomberg versus Trump and more about the structure, the structure of the U.S. political system, the polarization, the disgruntlement, as well as what we're seeing in other countries around the world and how the global order is actually unwinding in many ways. Right. If you think about what, let's assume we were going to have an extra session in the United States, and we, I'm sure we will at some point. The response that the government's going to have to have this time is going to have to be fiscal rather than monetary, right? We've used a lot of our monetary bullets. We've got low interest rates. We even have, you know, uh, Fed market action. We've seen Europe go to negative interest rates. Those options will still be there, but they're going to be far less effective. So the next time we need to get out of our uh, uh, an economic morass, we're going to need to spend money, and we're going to have to agree on how to spend exactly. that money. Exactly. We're going to have to agree on whether we're going to do infrastructure spending. We're going to have to decide where that money is going to be spent, and it's going to be state by state, and it's going to be a lot of things that have real the real um, necessity for political interaction and compromise in the way that it was, you know, when, when uh, you know, Patrick Moynihan used to go into the, to the Senate dining room and have conversations with his, quote, enemies and make actual decisions. That's not happening today. That dining room is empty. This is such and a critical that's point. What, that's what's going to be necessary that will be more difficult in the environment that Ian just talked about. It's such a critical point. I mean, after the 2008 financial crisis, the Americans came together 
and our allies came together with us. After 9-11, the Americans came together, and our allies came together with us. And whether it's the next recession or whatever the next crisis is going to be, it is so much harder to see the Americans coming together, and it's so much harder to see the allies coming together with us. Let's end on an upbeat note. Ian, David, when you think about our changing world at the start of this new decade, what are you most confident about and excited about? So if you take a look at the creation of wealth that's taken place uh, in markets and, and, and put aside for a moment about where that wealth is, but just the actual amount of, of value that's been created and the ability for the world to address the issues that it is facing, we are in great shape. And what I mean by that is you can take a look at, you know, whether it's in healthcare, in immunology, um, in, 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 in genetic engineering, CRISPR uh, studies that are being done now, all of that, the ability to address cancer, to address diabetes issues, and as I mentioned earlier, the ability to address the, the energy issue. We have the tools, we have the technology uh, to be able to do all of those things. So what's optimistic is actually the, you know, human innovation, right? The ability to continuously reinvent ourselves across the broad spectrum of, of really what's going on and the economic benefits of doing so, which you see in the marketplace today. That, to me, is the obvious good news. And the question then is what one does with it. And that's really what the conversation has been a lot about. What do governments do to enhance that or detract from it, improve the, you know, improve the experience of their populations or not? And, and that's really where the tension is. I look at the economy and, the, and innovation as the optimism. And I think of government and politics and the way that we're actually expressing uh, our, you know, that in the way we vote and act as the actual detractor. And that is the battle that, that's there. That's what we've been talking about. Whether that's healthy or not, that's just the reality of, of what's going on. And I would say two things. This is one of the reasons why I love diversified portfolios. You have to have a diversified portfolio to invest because you don't know what the successes are going to be over time. You can't choose to time what you're going to do in markets. And I would argue the same is true in this conversation generally, which is a lot of the trends that Ian talks about, writes about, and I think is one of the most insightful people about are going to pan out, and some of them are going to make sharp turns along the way, um, and there'll be unexpected moments. And I think that's, to me, you know, the what's interesting, but also in my mind, what what is uh, um, uh, you know opportunistic or uh, 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 you know optimistic because we don't know that all of the things that are supposedly bad are going to actually happen and end that way, right? We didn't know we were going to be here either, is what I think. What do you think? Um, I mean, it's clear that the politics are the the challenge that almost all of the major political trends in the world today are negative and frankly unsustainable. But balance off against that, the fact that David just said we've got all this wealth, right? We have the ability to respond. But perhaps even more important than that is the fact that the human innovation that is coming is not coming just from white America and Europe. It's actually coming from all over the world. And when the solution set to respond to problems is itself more diverse. That does two things for you. First of all, it makes you more likely to resolve the problems. But also, it itself undercuts the dangers from all of the my country firstism. Because it means that you increasingly are going to be forced to engage with and incorporate all of these diverse peoples into your own society or you'll fail at these solutions. That's a good thing. I mean, part of the reason why there's so much danger in the U.S.-China relationship right now is because the average American is unconvinced the Chinese are capable of innovating. We think they're stupid. We think they steal. But we don't think they could actually be technologically advanced. Well, in the course of the next two generations, we're going to have kids in this great country that are going to be, it's going to be completely obvious to all of them that actually genius and innovation doesn't just come from America or from people that look like them in Europe. It'll come from Africa. It'll come from China. It'll come from India. And I think that's going to make them more constructive human beings. So for me, I think that's a pretty positive th way to think about the world. Ian Brummer, David Balin, thank you both for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's it for this special edition of the G Zero World Podcast. Ian Bremmer will be back next week with more of his signature insightful interviews with global leaders and newsmakers. I'm Meredith Sumter. Thanks for listening. Oh, and try not to worry so much. This special edition of the G-Zero World podcast was produced in partnership with City Private Bank.
You're listening to the G Zero World with Ian Bremmer podcast, your weekly geopolitical deep dive into the world's biggest news stories, featuring in depth conversations with global leaders and newsmakers. To get more of G Zero's insights on global politics every morning, sign up for our free newsletter, G Zero Daily, at gzeromedia.com.